today we are hearing from Raul Carrillo, who is an attorney, deputy director of the Law and Political Economy Project, and an associate research scholar at Yale Law School. His research is critically analyzing money as a technology of government governance, excuse me, and he is a board member of the Modern Money Network and of Public Money Action. Um, with that, uh, I will hand it over to Ra. Um, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, good to see some of you again. It's been a while, and good to see new faces as well. Um, if we could just start off with some technical things, uh, please feel free to ask questions as I move along in the chat. I'll try to pause. I'm going to try to go very slowly in general without absorbing all the time for, for my presentation and leaving remaining time for the Q&A. Um, Hannah and, and Jeff, would you mind turning off your video? I think that might be helpful here. And then at the end of the presentation, when we move on to Q&A, um, folks are welcome to come on video uh, to ask questions or to ask questions with voice or to ask questions um, in the chat itself. Um, so for those of you who cannot see me, I am in my coffee shop and we're here to have a little bit of a chat about MMT and FinTech. And some of you I imagine are coming from the FinTech side and some of you are coming from the MMT side. I'm going to try to hold those two things together and do a general walkthrough of the terrain. Again, um, you know, I do plenty of work in this area um, along with Rowan Gray, especially. I'm not the only one. Uh, we're not the only ones within the broader paradigm um, who are doing work around fintech. Uh, there are people previously presented at the conference. Tamara Knopper presented on abolition, but she does great work around credit scoring. Uh, Jan Kregel has been moving a bit into fintech um, in the last few years. Randy um, is talking about indicators. There is stuff going on, but I do think that we have to upgrade our approach in many ways. A lot of the foundational appeal for MMT was in its ability to predict crises, was within a very, very technical understanding of um, a monetary policy, but the macroeconomy more generally. And things are going to shift technologically. Many of those shifts are already underway. The future of the money is here. Um, that's very much true in the private sector. JP Morgan recently released a report called Payments Are Eating the World, which is a riff off of Anderson, uh, Mark Anderson of Anderson Horwitz uh, venture capital firms, 90 statement that software was eating the world. Corporations of all types are getting into the money game. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why that's the case later on. The future is also changing in the public sector, and there is the prospect of a digital dollar system establishing a direct connection, potentially, between um, the Fed, the central banking system, or the Treasury, and the broader public, including households, firms, and individuals. So the plumbing, which MM, an understanding of the plumbing, which MMT so famously relies upon, is going to um, it's going to be necessary for us to change to understand the changes that are happening and that doesn't mean abandoning first principles in fact i think that mmt has a lot to offer as we'll understand it has a lot to offer the study of financial technology in general and the people who are studying financial technology i think actually help on the ops of mmt as well as its general trajectory um etc so the way that i'm trying to keep everything together during this talk is by going through the elephant uh, this was made by Neil uh, Winston Smith, who is a um, post Keynesian economist. Uh, some of you have engaged with him. Um, I think it's actually pretty helpful in displaying the paradigm and the different components that make up a monetary theory that flows from heterodox economics more broadly. And um, that includes post Keynesian economics, institutional economics, Marxian economics things borrowed from um, feminist economics and various other sort of critical traditions. And MMT really is an element or a, an elephant. It is a theory of things and how they work. Um, and it has to, uh, you know, has to accommodate with the changes 
Minsky studied financial capitalism and gave us a map. Uh, some legal scholars will say that we're now in the age of informational capitalism, where business models and investment and credit increasingly are about data and the money or the data that money produces. And so when these firms are changing, and again, the government is changing, we have to sort of you know figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to respond. So very quickly, we're going to walk through the elephant from an MMT perspective, for those of you who are not familiar with the paradigm, and then we'll upgrade the elephant. We're going to start here with the scientist on the top, and then we're going to go to the trunk of chartalism. Then we're going to go to the tail and the legs, so functional finance and sectoral balances um, together. Then we're going to go to the trunk of endogenous monetary theory, and then we'll come back to the tusk, excuse me. You can see the image. I think I misidentified the elephant. This is a great start for a presentation about information and classification, but uh, you can follow along there, I think, uh, relatively well. Okay, so um, what is FinTech? FinTech is uh, always been in the financial system. Whether you're talking about um, wax uh, bean, um, you know, stamps in Mesoamerica or ropes and elaborate knots in the Andes or um, tablets in Sumeria or, um, you know, the tally sticks from the Paleolithic era. We're talking about people using tools um, which are both practical and conceptual. Moreover, they have what um, anthropologists call, what um, some legal scholars call a material culture. And that just means that it's around us. We can touch it. I touch my phone, I'm touching money. I touch the cash register back there in my coffee shop, I'm touching money. There is a certain way of interacting with the technology that determines in large part how we think of the money. And that um, has a lot to say, I think, that can contribute to chartalism and again, our way of approaching all the changes that are going on. Okay. Um, and fintech itself, as we call it now, is an industry term. And that usually refers to um, technology firms from Silicon Valley, nominally making things easier, faster, more convenient. Like, I'm not going to lie, I use Venmo all the time. Um, I hate that it's owned by uh, PayPal, which is run by or associated with still uh, Peter Thiel and all these other people. But some of the convenience is really sort of undeniable in that you know, is the case for many of these apps, et cetera. Um, I do think that there is something new about this brand of financial technology, and it is not so much ease, convenience, et cetera, which is something that has improved over the years in many respects when it comes to actually using money and especially, you know, using it to transfer funds long distance, but it's really in the data play in the back of the house in the information that is supplied by the money. And that is in many ways a political choice, just as much as it is a legal choice, just as much as it is an economic choice, et cetera. Um, and so when we think about it, we really have to think um, about what's going on here in terms of power. Uh, it's a great, great, great uh, ability to influence the world if you can gather information about what people owe each other, about what people owe the state. There is a way in which money provides data that is necessary for all of the government to work, for commerce to work, et cetera. Christine Dizon talks about an exchange value for money in the private sector, to put it crudely, a fiscal value to money for the government. This overlaps with an informational value for money. And the way that this is constructed, again, is dependent on power. It's in the eye of the beholder, who's looking at the data. And on that point, and thinking about it in this way, um, brings me to the top of the scientist here, and where it says, it's just a description of the monetary system. I do think that there are mechanical and technical aspects to um, MMT that in many ways seem irreducible um, or, or seem to evade politics. And that in many ways is very important. That said, I strongly agree with Scott Ferguson 
um, in his discussion with Bill Mitchell at the 2019 conference talking about the future of MMT scholarship in which he said, um, you know, it is difficult or nay impossible, not impossible to look at something descriptively without bringing your own normative and political commitments to the table. And I think that's something fundamentally important that humanities, MMT humanities scholarship has redirected our attention to. And this is true in terms of data and classification as well. On superstructure, Will and Natty talk about monetary naming. Um, Will riffs off of Fred Lee, a microeconomist of MT, his idea that um, resources become, they do not just exist out in the world. And seeing them and classifying them is part of that process of becoming. Um, people have started talking about uh, money in terms of other sens uh, senses. Uh, Jacob Feinig, Jacob Feinig talks about monetary silencing. I'm working on seeing through money, um, what people gain from gaining this monetary information. This is all part in many ways of, of looking at money and we're talking about how we look at money. Um, and I don't think that we can talk about this without bringing political values to the table. So that's the top of the scientist. Um, let's go down to the trunk. So MMT says um, that money is a creature of the state in some of its earliest forms. I would say that what we have developed over the last 10 years or so um, is truly a uh, legal theory of money. And we are investigating the space in between public and private um, and the ways in which there is a hierarchy of money as Minsky would have it, as Merling has it, as Pistor has it, as Stephanie has it, et cetera, et cetera. But functionally, what we have here is, um, is the idea that money is essentially public. It doesn't froth from the markets. It doesn't come out of just commercial activity in general. If you look at it at an instrumental level, this is very clear. The coin says that it has the picture of the king. The reserve note has a bunch of like legal promises on it. Um, and it really, you start to see chartalism in a different way if you look at the technology a bit. But this is always associated with establishing a monetary circuit. You have to collect tax records. You have to organize a system based on knowledge in a certain perspective. Uh, we see that in the literature about surveillance. There is a controversial anarchist anthropologist named James C. Scott, who begins his um, discussion of legibility, of how we are perceived by the state, with a discussion of the creation of surnames for purposes of taxation in ancient England. And so there is always, again, this informational layer to money, and that's fundamentally important to chartalism. But chartalism is the foundation of MMT in many ways, or neo-chartalism, as we uh, as we call it now, that leads or that start right here at the tusk is the foundation for going around the rest of the element and talking about what banking is, talking about what public deficits are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just briefly on the cycle, so you can bear it in mind. And sorry, I meant to go through this earlier. But um, so MMT briefly says, I think, as a normative theory, money is public, money is legal. Um, when the government spends money, it necessarily goes away from the government. Their red ink is our black ink, as um, Stephanie would put it. Sectoral balances matter. The various, uh, as money flows throughout different parts of the economy, how much debt is in each sector, um, how much leverage, et cetera, that really matters. And then how the banking system, which we delegate some of the money creation to, how that works. Okay. Um, apologies again, I hope the elephant is helpful here, but back to chartalism and what's happening now. So, um, again, I think this distinction between, um, you know, money as an information network is really, really important. And I also think that, um, it's hard to explain chartalism without it in general. So we see discussion of it, even in the chartalist literature. And um, what we're talking about here is, again, this naming process, is, again, this seeing process. 
and it, money is used to demarcate spaces of the economy where markets should go. It is used to create, um, or it is one element that is used to create the economy more broadly. And so when you have the public foundation, which is set, then you get all these other monetary effects. Now, this model of using violence, as Matt for, for Forsetter talks about in his piece on uh, primitive accumulation and colonialism, um, this sort of violence that is needed to establish a stable base for the use of money is um, expressed in a certain legitimized way by the state, but it does not, it is not um, solely a model that is used by states. There's a long history of corporations issuing in their own credit in the United States that begins with railway and canal companies in the 19th century. There is a piece at justmoney.org by John Haskell and Nathan Tankus that starts about this, that talks about this industry um, entry into money and entry by public utilities. And then there's the history of company script, et cetera. So trying to demand that people use a certain form of money by collecting that money uh, for taxes or other things that people need to live is how you keep the money system going. And so when Forstatter talks about going into Africa, um, and specifically, I believe the Germans in East Africa, he talks about um, you know, turning the, uh, the indigenous crop system into a cash crop system by demanding that people um, pay taxes for um, having a hut at all, but, the, but they would need to sell cash crops to get the tokens themselves to pay the taxes. And what's happening now with um, projects like Facebook DM, which has morphed into um, other ventures involving WhatsApp and Instagram, what's happening with corporations trying to create their own currency is essentially to mimic this process in various different places and to establish the monetary circuit that is used in quote unquote developing countries. And this isn't to say that that is what it's going to make all the structural problems. Fadal gave a great lecture earlier. Um, Garina talked about all these structural factors that are important in terms of creating your own energy, creating your own food, et cetera, to be able to have a democratic economy, quote unquote, within a, um, within a nation state. And so what we're seeing is this attempt again to mimic the state, and that's done through the financial technology, that's done through putting currency onto people's phones, that's done through eventually saying, you need that specific currency to do X, Y, Z, and eventually you start to see, um, we're going to start to see some of these private corporations issue currency that is adopted by governments. Um, and that is, that is really the fear and that's mimicking dollarization, right? Sometimes when that process starts in the uh, developing world, what it also is accompanied by is the first digital ID system that exists in that country. And so what we see is Scott's um, discussion of naming back to um, using money as a tool to classify things. And we see in a very, very intense and visceral way, um, you know, people getting apps on their phone to use certain coins, et cetera, and having to create an identity and an identity that's determined by these corporations. They're mimicking state monetary functions as well. So, for this component, realizing what is going on in terms of trying to establish a monetary base across public and private actors is now very, very important. And people, I think, again, have complicated the narrative of state money by talking about legal money. And I think that's really, 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 really important here. So those are some updates on chartalism <laughs> that I think people um, you can explore a little bit more. Um, I think historians, anthropologists, very helpful here, but even on a more, um, you know, on the ground level, like this kind of stuff is, is insane. And a lot of the people who are working around trade, fair trade issues, people who are um, pushing around international structures, international currency structures, really need to get on this because it, it is like sort of the next level in the abuse 
of um, chartalism, even if it doesn't accomplish, as we know, all the functions of a state chartalist enterprise. It is still doing things, um, you know, that, that again mimic this process. Okay, so on to functional finance and sectoral balance. As I uh, mentioned at the top, functional finance is this idea, um, started by Abba Lerner in the uh, 40s, putting it crudely, that when the government issues currency, when it spends money, um, I'm using air quotes for the people who are listening, um, then it, um, it goes somewhere else, right? It goes into our hands, it goes into more likely the hands of the powerful, and it goes abroad. But it is an accounting identity that the money out equals the money in. If the, we see the world as a balance sheet, like Minsky does, all the debits and credits add up to zero, or they offset to zero. And that is no different when we talk about um, the government deficit versus the public or the non-government sector surplus, the non-government sector deficit <laughs> versus the public surplus. And sectoral balances, again, refers to where that money goes, what it means in terms of credit, debt, investment. Win Godley is the main um, heterodox economist here. And his theory was very helpful for understanding um, things that have happened that MMT has predicted. And I wanna just pick up on a couple of those very quickly. And that is number one, that MMT in many ways cut its teeth um, in analysis of not just the global financial crisis, but crises before that. And one of those was the internet.com bubble. And people realized that um, you know, in tandem with conservative approach to budget deficits, what was happening was their black ink was becoming our red ink. And we had debt problems, we had speculation problems, we had a crisis in the stock market. Um, there's a very good Business Insider article by Joseph Weisenthal that tells the story of the Clinton years, underemphasizes again that this is a technology story. And so watching investment in the tech sector is really, really crucial. And in fact, MNT has already in some ways pointed to that, demonstrated that, assumes that. And if you go back to, thank you so much, Mike. People are, are really great at the links here. Um, it's almost like we're a community. So if you go back to um, the talks in the 90s at the Levy Institute, you find people discussing um, uh, tech work or IT work at that point and how it fissured labor in many ways, separated people who could potentially be comrades from each other, how it um, started to look like an industry in which there was not a lot of productivity necessarily, but um, there was a lot of precariousness. If you go back to that time, you can see people starting to talk about tech a little bit in a way that is not necessarily the case now, but is, you know, is work that I think needs to get picked up in, in, a, big, in a big way. Um, so the other thing that I wanna mention on this point is that um, pumping money into the economy in the way that we want to put it crudely from the bottom up really now does require an understanding of the technology. So Pavlina talks about, um, again, this bottom up approach. We, I think all um, contrast that with a top-down approach of giving corporations money. Um, we wanna give money in, you know, hoping that they give money to people. We wanna give money directly to the people. We experimented that, or I should say the government experimented with that during the pandemic. The way it happened for small businesses was that the fintech companies were very involved in the lending. Um, and that was because of, again, this idea of ease and this idea of convenience. And what happened was a lot of fucking fraud and you can <laughs> open the congressional record. And so as an operational <coughs> as an operational point, the, trans the transmission mechanism of public finance fail. Um, Warren talks about the importance of understanding the operational mechanics here. And in this case, we had a technological failure that didn't even get these non-recourse loans, which is not even real government spending to the small businesses. Then in terms of sending out payments to people, there were a lot of problems with checks. Um, there were, I think, 20 million, 26 million adult dependents and children left out of that fiscal stimulus round because of informational problems, because they didn't know how to contact people. 
um, undocumented immigrants in general left out of that system. And when they tried to counter that in a bit of a clever way by sending out prepaid debit cards, um, a lot of those didn't make it again to people in rural areas. Um, and a lot of them didn't function particularly well. They all gave data back to the banks. They all gave data back to the government. It wasn't really focused on functionality and it sort of broke. Um, and this isn't to deny the general principle that we needed you know, stimulus and certainly stimulus or relief or aid um, more, um, we needed more than, than was given and we needed it in a different way. Um, but uh, our principles, you know, suggest that we um, adopt this sort of approach again in the next crisis or even just as a general matter, but it really makes a big difference as to how the technology is working. And so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of things to be done there, um, especially in terms of government payments. Okay, so I think people have heard a little bit about that, and generally sort of followed the deficit story in the um, you know in the news, etc. A little bit more concerning, and a little bit behind the scenes, is what's going on in the banking sector and capital markets more broadly, but really in banking and um, payments. Um, but banking being the source of financial instability or shadow banking being the source of financial instability. We're gonna focus mostly on that here. Okay, so endogenous money. So from the perspective of MMT, the state creates the money, right? The government issues the money that is the high powered money that is the money we have to surrender to the state when we are taxed. That is the form of money that we have to provide if we are stopped on the street for looking uh, for get, or getting uh, get arrested and have to pay bail or get somebody else to pay our bail. Um, it's the, the money that we have to pay when we get random fines. There is a enforcement behind the money that makes it what it is. That said, I think people understand that most of the um, credit points that they use, most of money as they're familiar with it, is bank money, right? And people get really, really tripped up here um, about whether MMT ignores the banking sector or not, whether it um, you know, ignores the fact that 99.9% .9 of money is bank deposits. Yes, that's true. And you can still recognize that fact and have a legal theory of money and approach things as MMT does. And the way that this is described in Stephanie's book, for instance, contra um, Josh Mason's argument, to which I responded on the LPE project blog, is that banking flows from central banking. And it seems like such an obvious point that people often miss. The Federal Reserve is set up as a hub of the banking system which has been delegated certain powers to create credit, to essentially create a, a, another form of money that we use in day-to-day -day activity. But that has a legal structure. The central banking system is the system that we have now. There were other systems before it. There are other systems in other countries. But this is essentially a delegation function. But the idea here is that if you were allowed to engage in this process, if you are allowed to essentially make money um, via government charter, <laughs> very literally, then there are certain responsibilities that you have, right? And there are certain regulations that you have. You are supposed to be a good steward of money. You are supposed to follow um, you know, certain regulatory requirements, capital requirements, liquidity requirements, um, obligations to depositors. You have to have deposit insurance. You have to have a resolution plan, et cetera. In theory, banking law is full of holes. Dodd-Frank didn't work very well. And, um, you know, we haven't held the, the banks, the legacy banks, to, um, to the law for a very long time. Bringing up this actually important question that, that Mason raises as to who's in charge. But nevertheless, legally speaking, the banks fall under the government and we allow them to do certain things, the most important of which is money creation, to create money from nothing, 
essentially, because what's at the back of the house for the bank is the government enforcement. Still, they've just made the banks into a middleman, a middleman that's gone out of control, but theoretically serves a very specific function within the system. Now, what happens when um, other companies that aren't banks start to take on this function, the money creation function, which start to lend outside of the requirements for lending, which start to hold money without deposit insurance, um, or uh, offer an instrument that promises one-to-one -one redemption, it's just as good as what you gave me, and then doesn't actually do it, doesn't have the legal ballast to do it, doesn't have, um, doesn't have the balance sheet to do it. And when those things start to fall apart, we get a huge crisis. And Randy Ray has a couple great articles about this, um, one in the UMKC Law Review, another in the Review of Banking Law, and that's, that's no accident, about the process of shadow banking and what happened in the global financial crisis. Bill Black, um, an MMT lawyer economist, um, right, also has written about shadow banking, I believe, in the Creighton Law Review um, back in the day, talking about how shadow banking also involves a fraud dynamic, uh, Gresham's Law. And all that means is that good money or that bad money pushes out good money. So when we see this sort of speculation based on this sort of false, fake banking layer, we know we're in trouble. Um, and that is where we are right now, in many cases, in the fintech industry. Ray's um, analyses still apply. Scott Fulweiler's analyses still apply about banks essentially being unhinged and being able to not being really constrained by regulatory requirements and those being malleable. Um, and what's happening is shadow banking in the tech sector. And in some ways, this is done on the lending side, again, in the sense that we have these algorithms now that decide how to lend. We have companies that are essentially just an interface between um, banks and consumers that are there to collect data and make things a little bit faster. We have companies engaging in the process of banking, in the process of delegated money creation that are completely unregulated. PayPal and Venmo are right now the size of a mid-sized bank um, without deposit insurance. Now, PayPal will co-mingle the money that you have in your wallet with its own money and get deposit insurance for itself. But that doesn't protect your ass. Like, you're just still fucked. Like, I'm fucked if Venmo goes down. And that's not because I have, you know, a bunch of dollars in it necessarily. But I might one day, and small businesses definitely do. So it's a note of contagion in the event of a crisis. A bit more concerning, and now we finally get to the part that everybody wants to get to, is crypto. Now, so uh, Rowan and I, as well as a lot of legal scholars who are close to the paradigm, um, have, you know, we would suggest that Venmo, your Venmo deposits, um, the deposits you have in wallets that again store their own, uh, that store funds rather than just information, and stable coins are all the foundation of a shadow layer in the banking system. Um, a shadow banking layer on which people bet on, on which people speculate, people use um, stable coins and other non-deposit deposits as collateral on loans. It's the stuff that makes up the rest of the grist of the mill, or it is the grist in the mill, excuse me. A stable coin is a, um, a type of cryptocurrency. It's a type of digital currency because some of them <laughs> don't hide shit from anybody. Uh, the stable coin is an attempt to get past Bitcoin's volatility. And Bitcoin is volatile as MMTers know, because it's based on the theory of metalism. It's scarce um, in a process that literally is meant to mimic gold mine. You have to use a massive amount of computer power to obtain these tokens. Um, like gold mining, some people hoard them. It's you have more power if you have, um, if you were an early adopter. And again, if you can keep going with the computing power. Um, and marrying that sort of gold mining model with a very ambitious attempt to create trust among strangers and have that, um, the ability to sort of call each other out on the blockchain 
with the technology, um, that that would hold things together. I'm not going to go into all the reasons that Bitcoin is volatile, in part because I think that activists and organizers within the community have actually done a great job on this front. I've seen a lot of people pushing back against crypto. I see the podcast doing it. Um, Real Progressives does this really well. But I do want to talk again about the stable coins. And the stable coins, because they reportedly or nominally trade at one to one, they are just as good as a bank deposit, just as good as the dollar in your pocket. They, um, they serve as the backbone of the entire crypto industry. And the stable coins make it a fragile infrastructure. Um, a few days ago, Terra, which is again a non-deposit, offers these non-deposit deposits that um, you know are, are supposed to be good. It collapsed, and about two, three nights ago, at like three thirty a.m., Tether, which is the largest stable coin broke the buck and w people were not able to redeem at one to one. And again, they had few rights against the issuer, um, against, uh, against Tether itself. And so now we're seeing a collapse in value. Now we're seeing the base fall out. I think that crypto is in trouble, but I also think they're not going anywhere. Um, to return to this point about gaining political influence in order to make your monetary system work, crypto is absolutely fucking flooding the hell. I've spoken with a lot of people, some of whom I see here in the audience, about the money that is going through the Democratic Party. Um, but even more disturbingly, going through progressives, going through justice dims, et cetera. And it's sort of polluting the environment in a way that's fundamentally problematic to public money, right? And to our mission. I do think, and again, activists and organizers have made a very good point that people are missing hope they don't have a sense of the future that is public. And that's in large part why people are there. Of course, many people just wanna make money quickly. And you know, for some people that's not a complicated decision, but other people are driven by other sorts of impulses. And there are ways that MMTers can, I think, meet that with some compassion um, and with patience. You know, that said, there's a lot of nefarious actors out there in the crypto world. So I'm not, I'm not saying everybody needs to offer an olive branch. I'm just saying that in some cases, um, you can work with these people. And in some cases, you can't. There are blockchain people in the MMT community. Um, some of you might be out there uh, potentially seething at this point. But I think people have done good work. Ben Wilson does uh, great work. Um, David Jetty does some blockchain things. Uh, people are investigating it. Young Kriegel, again. Um, and his fintech work suggests distributed ledger technology, et cetera. I have not seen the proof of work. I have not seen the promise fulfilled yet, but it's out there. And maybe it can be used for good purposes, maybe not. But in terms of what's going on uh, with the dynamics that MMT looks at, it's very problematic. It's an abuse of this charterless power. It's an abuse of the responsibility that was given to the banking sector. And just because the banks fucking suck doesn't mean the tech companies are necessarily going to be any better. Again, because this money also collects data. And that data itself is supposed to expand and go throughout the economy. Crypto, um, some of them collect a, a little data, as the name would indicate. Some of them collect a lot of data. The Facebook system wasn't even going to encrypt shit or it was going to encrypt transactions. And then it was going to store them in clear text on its blockchain for everybody, including law enforcement, to see. There are very few laws that govern data in general. Um, the laws that collect or protect us against um, abuse of financial data collection, like the Fair Credit Reporting Act, are dinosaur laws that are not built for the system. So that means when we're talking about all this data flowing from this money, we're talking about, again, a significant amount of political power to sort through this data, of economic power, of market power to sort through this data. But um, we are talking about things fundamentally changing. And the data problem is wedded with the financial instability problem. We see tech investment it is totally bonkers um, in a way that is, uh, you know, very obviously problematic, 
to MMT scholars, I think, but could use a little bit more attention. And we see this um, this insane layer in the financial uh, system that crypto and all these other companies are creating. Um, you know, again, the lending sector is doing it too. And we know what happens when loans are hawked without protections at certain people who are credit invisible, who have not supplied very much information to the formal financial system, et cetera. And again, that's a, a pollution of the base layer. That is a problem at the foundations of the financial system that eventually causes instability in capital markets, et cetera, and can lead us to an entire crisis. So what do we do? So we've talked about um, public legal theories of money, how tech companies are trying to um, change things here, again, in a, in a very primary way. So that's the tusk. Uh, we've talked about the trunk down here, the banking. We've talked about public sector ebb and flow with the tail and with the legs here. So now we're gonna start looping back around. We're gonna go to the job guarantee which I think is a core element of modern monetary theory. And then we're going to come back to chartalism and sort of the broader theory of MMT in financial technology. So in MMT, there is an idea that, A, we want a full employment economy, um, and we want that, we want public spending for public jobs, for public goods, et cetera, to be the engine of the economy rather than bank growth. And again, Stephanie does this really well in the deficit myth. When we talk about existing monetary policy, we are talking about the Fed, again, the central bank, creature of the state, creature of Congress, even if it claims to have certain independent functions. And we, uh, we set up this system, right, where we use banking as the way to grow the economy and we stabilize banks in order to stabilize the economy. And what this essentially means is the banks are always going to be in the driver's seat in some way because they're indispensable. They're too big to fail. Um, you know, we ran, again, most of the pandemic uh, program through the banking system, um, even if there, there were these FinTech business loans and there were the payment cards that went out to people. Uh, we use it for everything. And in the big theory, if you manipulate the banking system through interest rates and you manipulate the interest environment more broadly in private finance, you change things in the economy more broadly. We want to move away from that. We want to go back to the Treasury. We want to go back to Congress. We want to go back to fiscal power, which demands, of course, gaining fiscal power, which we don't have right now in a political sense. Um, but we want to move away from all of that, right? And the theory um, within MMT says that instead of modulating the number of, or attempting to modulate the number of people who are employed and unemployed in the economy through the Fed, through the banking system, through business, what we will do is we will make sure everybody has a job, that volatility will be gone. And, um, you know, we can use other tools to manage inflation, to manage um, demand, to manage things in the economy. And some of those tools are regulatory. Nathan Tankis just put out a great report from Public Money Action talking about um, new tools in the context of fiscal expansion, what it would mean to regulate prices if we did something like the Green New Deal. Uh, Rowan Gray also has a great piece in the inflation series at the Law and Political Economy blog series. Um, but the most, um, the thing here to realize is the job guarantee is a direct counter to this model. It is certainly attached to a theory of democracy loosely. Um, it intersects with the civil rights tradition and some people in MMT have actually, you know, been very, very involved with that um, set of things. And the parts of the labor movement that supported the job guarantee are still there, even if there are fissures within um, workplace organizing more broadly with respect to the job guarantee. Now, it's a direct challenge in the sense, again, that we say we're just gonna have full employment and we're going to use other tools to regulate inflation. It's a much more humane system. Derek Hamilton, um, also a uh, MMT fellow traveler who's spoken at uh, many of our conferences and events, talks about the job guarantee as um, 
you know, a way to end the discrimination in the labor system. It's always the last people fired or the first last last hired first fired are certain groups of people, right? And if we look at unemployment now um, and chop it up by demographic, like those numbers are drastically, drastically different. And if the Fed allows a, or if the Fed wants to raise rates at a time when black unemployment is double digits, um, it's doing a particular thing and it knows it's for doing a particular thing. And, um, you know, M, uh, Coretta Scott King and the Full Employment Action Council challenge that. We all challenge that. Now, what does it mean if we want a job guarantee in the tech sector? Or, excuse me, a job guarantee that responds to what's going on in the tech sector and in the, and in the fintech sector. It means, I think, that one, we have to actually position ourselves in a concrete way, and this is, again, an organizing thing, against um, the idea of gig work, the idea of part-time work that disorganizes people, that is meant to crush um, worker power as well as worsen material conditions for workers via technology, via the data play, et cetera. And in some senses, um, this has a direct financial component. For instance, Uber will lend um, uh, to its drivers so that they can um, you know, get, use their cars. That's a, an obvious problem. Um, but then they're, uh, you know, positioning ourselves against that is, is really, really important, right? Because job guarantee would always be an option for people um, not to do that. And it isn't to say that, you know, especially in the beginning stage, stages, it wouldn't, you know, people wouldn't make more money driving Uber, but we can provide a robust alternative. Um, and Derek, I think, does a good job of directly opposing those forces in a way that we also need to be, do, be doing constantly. The job guarantee is supposed to change the quality of work. Um, it's supposed to, if you can walk away from your racist, sexist, um, you know, transfer boss, then that's full employment to me. If you can um, leave and be in another workforce that is organized, that's a super win for me. Um, and again, I, you know, as Derek said, I think it makes it more humane, but how we construct these jobs also matters a lot. So there's the offensive strategy and then there's the process of construction it, itself. And if we do want to match people um, or excuse me, if we do want to take people where they're at and say, you know, a job is anything that someone pays you to do. Um, I think that data is really helpful. On the other hand, a lot of data collected is easily um, used in a violent way or an oppressive way by local governments. And we see that even when local governments are trying to be um, trying to be nice or trying to take care of people. The fact is that we're dealing with a lot of power here and we need to be careful about the way that data is used in the job guarantee. I don't anticipate that in a world where we win a job guarantee, uh, we want to have like Amazon like working conditions with that sort of surveillance, the surveillance that truckers have right now. Um, we certainly don't want these lending um, relationships with workers. We don't want people getting uh, advanced wage payments through their fintech apps, et cetera, um, in the private sector, but we really want to supply a different sort of work experience and we need to be affirmative about that. So the other thing that I would just note here is that that goes hand in hand with the way we change the monetary system in general. So looping back around to the Tusk and to NAP's chartalism here, um, we're reorganizing the public sector. Like all this, all this crazy fintech shit is happening, but now we have the opportunity for public fintech, which goes right down the line with what m and is all about. There are ideas for, again, changing this system to a digital fiat currency system, to a digital dollar system. And while people might object and say, money is already digital, I use my bank money, um, you know, that's online, I don't see what the issue is. We are talking about a direct relationship between um, the government and other economic units in the economy, the companies, the businesses, the us, like that, that's all, that's a structural change that MMT has to come to grips with. Now, Rowan and I have done some work around this space. Um, you know, in addition to sort of uh, supporting private side regulation to supporting public banking, the job guarantee, et cetera. And 
we have argued for the replication of digital cash, um, essentially to maintain the idea that public money is accessible to everybody, whether they have an internet connection at all or high speed internet access. Um, for one, one in three, I think adults in the United States lacks high speed internet access in this home, uh, in their homes, prohibiting essentially um, FinTech from reaching them. I think Terry Freeline's in the audience. Um, her book, Banking on a Revolution, talks about the interface between digital inclusion and financial inclusion, among other things. Um, so cash, we created, or we are proposing a cash system that works online to still really fulfill the promise of public money, to still reach everybody. And we think it could be, you know, have its own own category of uses in the context of a stimulus. Um, you know, th we didn't have to send everybody bank um, cards that link, you know, back to Comerica Bank, and then God knows what happens with the data. It didn't have to happen that way, and they could have reached people uh, much more further. I think, you know, we're doing a lot there in terms of drawing privacy allies and, um, you know, people who sort of care about the Constitution, um, et cetera, racial justice folks, tech justice folks. But this is just one intervention in this broader system. And that is just one way in which we are talking about rebuilding public money. But everything I just touched on, um, wow, for a long time, um, this is all sort of up for grabs. It's, it's the terrain on which um, things will play out and the future of our paradigm will play out. I've mentioned things I think that are particularly attractive to folks in particular disciplines if they're scholars, but there's a fucking shit ton of work to do in like every area of the economy and all the places that we organize in. Um, crypto is really on the march. You know, again, the market collapsed not very long ago. Um, we see places where crypto is taking over public money functions, El Salvador being the um, most tragic, um, switching from the dollar to Bitcoin. Um, but it's sort of wild out there. And we, uh, I think, need to be thinking about this more a little bit. There's a lot to learn. Um, I learn a lot every fucking day and every few weeks I feel like it. Excuse me. Every few weeks, I feel like I was a fool a few weeks before, um, which is why it really takes a network and it takes a community to sort of understand this stuff. And I'm hoping that I've just shared a few notes um, that people can take going forward. And we can now use the remaining half of this time to have a conversation. Is that all good, Hannah? Ashley? Yeah, I think so. I think. Um, everyone has the ability to turn their microphones on if you want to ask a question. Um, down in the audio section, you might have to leave the audio and then rejoin audio and rejoin with your microphone. Um, if you want to go ahead and unmute and ask a question, we might want to use the hand raising feature to get people sort of, um, in some kind of order um but while people are figuring that out uh brian kim in the chat has said do you think consumer protection laws can provide sufficient protection um in talking about fintech and the ease of credit um or is this genuinely a dangerous trajectory if you want to um, answer or talk about that a little bit while people um, get their hands raised and or unmute themselves or figure out how to unmute themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Great question, Brian. Great to see you. Um, thank you for staying awake in South Korea. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what the time zone difference is, um, but you've sort of like approached exactly what I've been thinking about in my legal scholarship for the last few weeks. Um, so we're very simpatico there and perhaps that's no surprise. Good job, Twitter. Um, but in the United States, so the consumer law authorities, um, they come out of a particular moment. They come out of the 70s in the Ralph Nader times. And when people thought that they were going to organize as consumers, um, but nevertheless um, hit up against the rocks of consumption being a very individualized thing. 
and more broadly, they made sort of a peace with business in which if, as long as things were kept within a certain bounds, most importantly, as long as they were cheap, then um, they were not gonna go to war, so to speak. And our consumer laws are very individualized in the United States, at least. Um, people have you know, private rights to correct things on their credit reports, for example, but the, um, but the consumer laws that have to deal, that would apply to all of these things, at first seem like they won't. Um, what is the point of trying to read a click wrap contract for a credit product that you're getting when you know it would take you, you know, a couple of days to read it. And even then, what are you going to do? Object to the loan that you want and you don't know what half of it means anyway. Um, so that's a huge problem that our laws are just not really equipped for that in the United States. That said, I think that not arguing um, against this sort of business model from the position of that set of consumer laws or the statute based laws um, from back in the day is, um, so I don't think that's helpful, but I think that there's a, so there's a set of powers at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau about when practices are unfair. Um, and this came from the Federal Trade Commission, but in the Dodd-Frank times, there was um, you know, a discussion in the legislative history in um, the formation of the bill that something unfair had happened to people that caused systemic problems. And that thus those practices that caused the eventual harms downstream, that, um, that they, had, uh, you know, they had done something wrong. And so the CFPB really is empowered to go after systemic problems, I think, in a way that um, you know, wasn't possible or hasn't been possible for consumer law previously. So I do think there's a way to sort of attack this base as being fundamentally um, not okay. That said, it would take a lot of work. Um, I think Rohit Chopra in the United States, our Consumer Financial Protection Bureau director is aggressive, but it's, it's going to be a long haul if that is one of the tools that we pick up. So I don't see anyone that has their hand raised at this point, but there was another question in the chat. Um, is it accurate to say from a sectoral balances perspective, banks belong in the private sector, but from a functional perspective, banks can be quote unquote public depending on the context, i.e. agents of the federal government? Um, so, yeah, and I would work. <laughs> I will defer to an MMT economist in the audience who says otherwise, but I think when you model these things, when you model bank credit, you sort of, you put it in the private sector, but from, you know, from a charterless standpoint, from a legal standpoint, the banks occupy, again, a special sort of public private function in which they are delegated this power of money creation. Um, various legal scholars talk about it differently. Um, uh, Bob Hockett and Saleh Omarova have a piece called The Finance Franchise that discusses this relationship, this structural relationship between banks and the government. Uh, Morgan Ricks has a uh, piece called Money as Infrastructure in a book called The Money Problem. They talk about this that, are, that we very closely, again, with, with Ray, with Mosler, with Bill Black. Um, and there's a lot to say about it here. But um, yeah, I would say they sort of cross that divide, even if it's important for MMT scholarship to differentiate from the processes of bank credit and, um, and government spending for, for modeling, et cetera. Nobody has any questions about crypto? Are you serious? Well, I mean, anyone is welcome to mute, unmute or post questions uh, in the chat. It looks like Ro posted, if we were to consider Fred Lee's heterodox micropricing theory to be broader, a part of the broader MMT paradigm, is there anything we can add to that from the fintech angle? Thanks, Ro. <laughs> so I think, you know, we talk about, um, when we talk about Fred Lee, 
microeconomist who taught uh, Stephanie, who taught a lot of the original UMKC folks. Um, I'm sure, Pody's out there. Anyone can reestablish or resituate this relationship if they'd like. But Fred Lee studied the micro side of MMT, um, and he had theories of price administration that are very close to legal scholars, legal realists at the time, Gardner Means, um, Adolf Burl, um, et cetera, that says that firms administrate prices. There are auction prices, those exist, et cetera. But um, firms have their own power, right? And when we talk about fintech companies, involvement in, in price administration, we're talking about one, interest rates are price, right? So it is setting conditions of credit um, for many people in small businesses. We can talk about fintechs, um, you know, role in setting up indices. Um, Fred Block has a really interesting piece at the Levy Institute recently that talks about problems with macroeconomic indicators and technology. But I think even when we're talking about how people look at credit scoring, how they look at these sorts of things, how they screen our payments and determine prices, that all fits in. Uh, those are the functions that I can think of off the top of my head. Rowan, you're welcome to expand. The other thing I would say, just to go back to um, this thing about naming and recording, is the blockchain, right? And Fred Lee's point about resources becoming is, again, about record keeping. And it is about money, I think, classifying things just as much as it is, it is about those deeper economic points that he's trying to talk about. Blockchain tries to take a record of things and suggest ownership of things by depersonalizing the naming or by nominally making it communal. You go back to this idea again that it's a metalist system, but the idea is to share a story, right? To share a story about the resources are, what the resources are, what they do, who has them, etc. So on the island of Yap, in the South Pacific, there is a community, a group of people who have long used boulders, giant boulders, giant disks as forms of money. And the way that they keep a record around this is that they share a story. And people who deviate from that story are socially ostracized. There's um, you know, all kinds of effects that uh, you know, punish you if you sort of deviate from this story. Now, the idea is that everybody trusts each other so much and have all these other communal ties that no one is going to do that. That doesn't mean that fracas didn't occur, right? People can lie. People can you know, move the boulders in the dead of night. People can do all these things. This is the fucking blockchain, right? The blockchain is people telling each other a story about money um, and they have different parts of their material culture that tell them different things. We got into this a little bit on Scott's presentation. And the idea is, but the idea with the technology in blockchain is that you can replicate this trust process among strangers. So you have people passing around sort of um, these tokens and using the blockchain to put property on, to um, create NFTs, to name these new things, to bring them into the system. And I, you know, I haven't gotten there, but I think there's maybe a conceptual bridge that is important there and is interdisciplinary. I don't know how successful we are at um, enabling people to unmute. I think it's a little tricky if you join without your microphone initially, but um, Jess has a question and Brian has another question. Do you want to go ahead and read and answer those? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So I don't want to skip any of these. Uh, apologies if I do. Jess's question first. Um, okay, the crypto folks who want an alternative to fiat and think that's what they're getting are likely to cling to crypto. Do you think there's room for alternative currencies that obtain banking charters um, to replace the speculative crypto market? Okay, so I don't want to totally throw the baby out with the bathwater with respect to blockchain. And again, there are people in this community who I think are trying to do good things with blockchain. The coins are not our jam, obviously. 
So from a monetary design perspective. Um, and I think we need to be very careful about what's happening now because it's just like, you know, venture capital betting on things and suckering day traders, day traders, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, that makes it all a little bit problematic. That said, people are experimenting with all kinds of currencies at the municipal level um, using various different technologies. And there is room for tech to make those things work easier. Um, you know, the uni idea can run on tech. Uh, either, I mean, there's no reason it couldn't run on privacy respecting tech. When we talk about transit systems that exist now, some of them function you know, more or less online. They collect different data, they do different things. So you can construct public money systems using some of this same tech. I'm not sure that we want to replicate some of those same functions. Um, the idea that we're pushing with the eCash Act with Representative Lynch, who's the head of the FinTech Task Force, who Rowan and I have been looking for a long time, is that if you create digital cash, there is no use case for crypto or stable coins for payments. Why would you use this like private junkie money that always fucking breaks, um, that you often lose your shirt on? Why would you use it for payments? Um, in most crypto right now is used for speculation, and in some senses that would continue, but we'd set up a defensive barrier between crypto actually becoming things that people use to mimic the functions of money. Alternative currencies that you know arise from public or collective action can be useful for particular purposes, and in fact, that's also part of regulating crypto. But as MMTers, we know we have to go to the federal level eventually and start creating public fintech. Like that is what it's going to take. Back to the point about like the material culture and the way we interact with monetary technology be really important. Um, you know, crypto ads are everywhere. They're on every fucking train in the outer boroughs in New York City. Um, they're on the Super Bowl commercials, etc. It's cool. Like I like you know um, you know playing around with my phone, etc. Um, and it's you can't do that with public money very well right now. Like. Even you know the bank, the legacy banking apps are not fun. There's no haptic quality. There's no expository quality. It's it's not it's not nifty. It's not cool. And so in a lot of ways, that's really important. You know, as I told Scott at the top of his Declaration of Independence talk, I think his work is really important because it's you know this place is going to turn. This is going to operate a lot based on how it works culturally. Um, so I do, to get back to the question, I do see properly regulated alternative public currencies as helpful. Um, I think they serve different functions, um, but we can build them. And if we, if we can get a really good narrative and system going both, both of them, then we can push back. Um, should I take Brian's question? Okay, uh, Pody notes that resources becoming uh, comes from Sturgeon, who is was Fred Lee's department chair. Thank you for that bit of uh, UMKC history. Yeah. I I still don't see any hands raised or anything. So if you want to go ahead and answer Brian's question. Okay. Um, okay. So Brian's asking if, you know, the fact that banks use FinTech to match with or even attract customers troubles endogenous money theory. So, does the fact that banks use the credit reporting system, use lead generators, use all these other companies to actually create credit, invalidate the idea that banks create credit essentially from nothing? And I don't think that that's the case. I would welcome people to trouble that idea, but I don't think it, you know, seeing an ad on Facebook for a loan does take you to the bank. And without that sort of connection, the credit creation doesn't happen. I think that's true as an operational fact, but that doesn't change 
I don't think that disturbs the idea that banks create credit in a specific way with specific legal privileges and that operationally, you know, assuming again, they have no operational deficiencies, tough assumption, but they have no, uh, excuse me, I think that as long as they can reach the customers, then it's not trouble. Then in any idea that the basic relationship is not trouble. I'd welcome people to pick that question up though. It's a very good one, Brian. It looks like Ro is typing, but I yeah. can go ahead and <laughs> go ahead and ask. Being, making MMT relevant to our useful ally, to our movement allies, elected officials, and having answers to the contemporary pressing problems of crypto matter to that. Um, yeah, so I think MMT is, is helpful here again, mostly under the banner of a public money ethos. And a lot of the action right now in terms of organizing is obviously occurring on a municipal and local level. So what we want to do there is give a different message of hope. Um, so, you know, offer our, and share our ideas about how the public monetary system works and, um, you know, suggest a different direction that is about all of us. So these crypto schemes, you know, as much as they're about building wealth, especially for particular communities, that is obviously not how it works, right? We're talking about a form of money that is specifically built to enable private accumulation. And making it clear, I think that, um, you know, for it really to be about us, we all have to have a say in the system. We don't purportedly rely on the tech itself, which really relies on the power of a lot of private actors, foundations, early adopters, hoarders, people like Sam Bankman Fried, who builds giant crypto derivatives firms and then donate to Biden, um, et cetera. I just posted my question in the chat so people can see a written version of it, but um, could you briefly talk a little bit more about where people can find more information about this um, replication of the state creation of money via violence by corporations, um, sort of, you know, as a continuation of your work on Facebook's Libra, which is not, which is no longer, if I remember correctly. Um, but can you just let us know where we can find some more interdisciplinary uh, work in that area or does that need to be developed still? Um, yeah. It, it needs to be developed. There is, is work out there. Uh, Rowan's work on digital fiat currency, um, you know, necessarily talks about the banking system as well. And he has pieces specifically about banking, but about the general idea of corporations being involved in or mixing with the money process. I think we um, had a good discussion of that at the last MMT conference or the last time that we were able to be together um, in 2019. And there was a panel with Ro and Tamara and myself that discussed precisely this dynamic. Um, and even though Libra DM doesn't exist anymore, um, it's still very important. Like people don't realize that Facebook is still out there, uh, you know, spreading WhatsApp pay throughout um, Brazil or, you know, um, that they're not out there creating Facebook credits for small businesses. They're not still engaging in this idea, even in a less ambitious way. Amazon's in lending, Apple's in lending, they all have wallets. Um, so it's a process to be followed in the news as well. But if you haven't gotten to it yet, I would certainly recommend um, Rowan's work. I would recommend the panel from last year. And um, that piece, that just money piece that was shared at the top by Nathan Tankus and John Haskell. Um, okay, so that's a question about, um, okay, so there are a lot of contexts where MMT rightly encourages skepticism of local solutions that come at the expense of macroeconomic solutions, i.e. public banking and federal budget, local currencies versus state money. Can you talk a little bit how you see the fintech intervention 
is straddling the act local think global divide or how you conceive of it okay i can provide that answer rowan do you want to come uh come online or open up to talk a little bit more about that because i'm not exactly sure where you want me to go that i haven't already gone Okay. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I'll just go ahead and take it. I have, you know, I've been involved in, you know, a variety of these efforts at local and state things as well. The New York City Public Banking Coalition probably being the most important one. I think in general that organizing around the idea of public money and that we have a say in the design and regulation of the monetary system. And not just, um, we are not passive economic answers, that we are not, um, that we ourselves are not silent, that we are not unnamed, that we are not unseen, et cetera, is very important. And in a power building sense, that's invaluable. But you can also demonstrate some proofs of concepts at this level. If you use a FinTech system to build local currencies, et cetera, um, and they work within a closed circuit, like you've demonstrated um, a lot of the ways in which the monetary system works more broadly at a much more simple level. Uh, Randy was designing buckaroos at UMKC a while ago, fought all had Denison dollars. Now we have this concept of the uni. Again, there's no reason that that can't, um, you know, use some of new financial technology. Um, and there are enterprises like that that are going around. There's an idea for an inclusive value ledger um, in New York. And a lot of municipalism in general right now is international, right? And there are ways to do things differently. And a lot of it is, a lot of the lessons learned are from comparing things. I spent some time in the UK um, where I was sort of studying a system called the Brixton Pound in West Indian community in London, where they were struggling to go digital. They had these wonderful, gorgeous um, analog notes that had pictures of famous people on them uh, who had come from Brixton and like David Bowie, um, for instance, back in the day. Um, but anyway, <laughs> they couldn't upgrade to digital and that was a huge problem, right? And they tried to do that and it was working for a while, but they had trouble expanding. So learning from other, learning from technologists learning from people who are, you know, sort of trying to find solutions and, and trying to share your MMT stuff with them. And um, I mean, I guess I'm just trying to say collaboration is very important here at the end of the day. And when you're talking about municipalism, municipalism and tech specifically, um, that community exists. And there are people out there doing great projects. Um, one person to follow about this would probably be Brett Scott, who um, spoke at the very first MMT conference as a cash activist and is now um, about to publish, I think, a book called Cloud Money about fintech. And while well, Brett is sort of a hacker himself still, he um, gets MMT, um, very MMT um, consistent for the most part. So a book worth checking out, I think. All right, Hannah and Ashley, we don't have to keep people here late if uh, they want a book, but it's your call. It's totally up to you. You mm -hmm. still got questions in the chat. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, help me out here. No worries. So, um, Brian says, we're calling the socialist calculation debate, the argument against public planning and administration, uh, was that central entities can't discover and deal with information. If we're advocating for public money, shouldn't there be a better understanding and plan of this issue of information and discovery? Can or should there be a parallel public administrative system that can do what banks can do, TLDR? Can public administration substitute or outdo private information processing? So, yeah, so there is an idea um, 
that we will use the new digital dollar system to create public bank accounts for everybody. And in theory, this would greatly help if the state were to, you know, widen its gaze, then this would help with taxation. This would help with combating illicit flows. This would help with um, monetary stimulus, that this could help with essentially everything if we collected more data. What we have to balance that again is again, the power that is involved when you know everything about everybody. One reason I am not excited about federal lending is that that comes with federal debt collection. And if there is, um, if there's a snitch in the public bank account system, essentially, then we've jeopardized a form of monetary space of privacy that has existed for thousands of years. So I do think that collecting information, especially business information for the purposes of regulation, um, is really, really important. And um, if we have a public banking system or an NIA or something like that, you know, collecting data about balance sheets, positions, real owners um, of things, et cetera, it would be absolutely crucial. I am wary though of the way in which information is processed now and the way in which it sort of sloshes around between a lot of companies and the government. So this is again, another area in need of, I think, intricate um, study, but also just we need energy around it. Like, um, you know, people are not, people are talking about what the next system is gonna look like in a very narrow space among central bankers, among boring ass legal academics, um, among a few policymakers on the Hill. And what this looks like belongs to everybody. Everybody touches money, right? Like wasn't the reasons that we're here is that money, you know, is a social relationship, but it also has practical qualities as technology and infrastructure. And we deal with that shit every day. We touch it every day. We smell it every day. We see it every day. And like that entire future is, is happening in a closed room or it's being discussed in a closed room. So, um, yeah, these questions are, I think, of critical importance. And I think it's, it's really good to dig at them from whatever angle you're coming at from, uh, you're coming at it from, Brian. Awesome. Thanks, Ra. I think with that, we will go ahead and wrap it up for the day. We're just at about our 90 minute mark. Um, thank you for your presentation and thank you for answering questions for everyone in the audience. Uh, there will be a recording of this posted on the Modern Money Network YouTube channel, the same as all of the rest of the conference sessions. Thanks again for joining us today, and hopefully we will see you again next week for our debt forgiveness panel. Um, otherwise, uh, good to see everyone, and we'll see you next week.